about. Um, these are just two of my favorites, and I can't skip this slide or go too fast. So Pinkney Cedar is just this adorable little plant that is really fragrant, and it hangs to the cliff sides, and it's really not a script, but it's super beautiful if you get to know it. And last year I was in Hinacate in Mexico, and it was everywhere. So it's a Sora Desert species that's found in the park. Um, this other one on the left is just so cute that I can't help but show you this plant. It, um, it's parasitic, so it doesn't have any chlorophyll. So it actually robs and steals from its neighbors. And it's always covered in sand and just looks kind of messy. Oh my god, okay, I'm going to move really fast. So I wanted to spend the next hour <laughs> talking about invasive plant species because it is one of our largest programs. So I'll go fast to this. I mean, is everybody pretty familiar with the concept of biodiversity and how non-native or exotic plant species can impact biodiversity? Yeah? Yes. All right. Good. So um, what we need to do as managers is actually prioritize our actions. We can't take on every non-native species that comes into the park. So we look at the different definitions, and the, the plants that we focus on are the invasive ones. So they're the plants that have a lot of characteristics that allow them to just really beat down the natives. Some of them are, they may be impalatable to the wildlife, they have incredible seed production. Um, these are the things that you see tumbling down the road. In fact, just today when I was driving back from the South Rim, I had a, a Russian thistle get stuck in the front of my car. So they're spread like that. The wind was incredible today. Um, other things like just sticky seeds or birds, so they get stuck in the fur of an animal walking by. So all these things make them really kind of outcompete the natives or give them some sort of an advantage. So they come by a lot of different mechanisms. Um, my favorite one is the bow with grass on it. I don't know where that photo plant came from, but that was classic. Um, but anyone who's hiked around this area or taken a walk has probably ended up with really sticky, annoying seeds in their socks. That's a great way to transport non-native plant species. So as a manager, we've got to prioritize. So what do we do? We try to look at the species that can be easily managed and also pose a substantial impact. And there's kind of a tricky balance to figuring out what those are. So we actually went through a very large process, it was part of my master's work actually, and kind of figuring out what that would look like. And while you can't see the graph on the left, the thing that's important about it is the first species that we want to target are the ones that pose the greatest threat and, and are the easiest to control. And so that's the box on the top right. And you'll notice that's where the fewest dots are. That's the take home message. There aren't that many that fall into that category. So, and it's because of the easy to control part. So the next thing we do is we look at the ones that pose a significant impact and well, or, and, and are hard to control. And that's kind of the area that we're working in right now. Um, there are a lot of just kind of strategic goals, preventing invasion, increasing awareness, and I think our program has hopefully done a pretty good job with those. We do produce a lot of kind of just outreach material, and we'll be doing a lot more of that over the next couple of years. Hopefully we do pretty well with that. And partnerships, I can't say enough, they're just the, the bottom line to everything. And we've worked with a lot of different groups. Um, we currently have, I wanted to mention, uh, an environmental assessment that's out for public review. I want to thank Rachel Stanton for all the work that she did on it. It's really, she did a great job. Um, but you've got time right now to actually read this, think about what we are proposing to do, and provide any comments you might have. Um, so there are different alternatives, and we look at what those actions could mean to other resources, and it's available on the park's website. Is that the right thing? So at this point in time, what we're doing is we're targeting 80 species, those highest priority species. And if you look at the graph over time, you'll see that in the 1930s there weren't that many species. And in 2008, actually we just increased the number again, I think we're up to 190 
non-native species. Um, and again, they're ones that have been, whether accidentally or intentionally, introduced into the park. Um, to highlight just a couple of those species, I might have to go through these really fast too. Scotch thistle is one that I've seen um, up in Utah, and when it really starts growing in an area, it can completely blanket the ground. It's got like a silvery, kind of fuzzy leaf, and the rosettes can be like just incredibly wide. Um, and it can absolutely exclude anything else from growing in those areas. Uh, Mediterranean sage, I don't know that I've ever seen it in Flagstaff. Does anyone from Flagstaff know it is in Flagstaff? Okay. We had one area in the park, we actually think it probably came in on the train, it was just along the railroad tracks, and we've been targeting that one, gosh, since I've been here, so since 1993. And we just used manual removal to control that one. Russian knackweed is one of the more difficult ones. We, I think pretty fortunate in Grand Canyon. There's really only a couple of areas where we find that one. In other parts of the country where you see Russian knackweed, it will grow to the absolute exclusion of any other plant. And control is incredibly difficult. So I think we're pretty lucky. Dalmatian toad flax, any of you who've been in Flagstaff, outside of Flagstaff, you've seen this one. This is the pretty yellow flower. So a lot of people are shaking their heads, you know. Um, it is really difficult to control. And I have actually been pulling a patch in my yard since I moved into my house. And pulling is really not the most effective way to get rid of the species. So you've got to look at other control methods. Um, high seed production. So that's another one of those that characteristics that I had mentioned. This is one that is starting to spread not only throughout the Southwest, but we're starting to see it in Grand Canyon. We've seen it along the river corridor, and we've seen it on the south here. I've never seen it on the river here yet. It's got these burrs that can absolutely puncture tires. Definitely bicycle tires and probably car tires. It's ridiculous, this plant. And it, it'll travel in those tires. Um, it'll travel in the bottom of your shoe. It can poke through your foot. And it's got some very um, kind of beautiful growth forms and leaves, so it's kind of it's cute, but it's it's really invasive and we are starting to see it spread. The inner canyon is um, obviously logistically challenging area. We have to kind of focus again on just the, the most invasive species. And we've actually got some pretty good success stories with these species. So again, we have to look at the ones that have the most substantial impacts and that we can easily manage. Rubenegrass has been an ongoing control program since the 1990s. And we've removed, I said over 30,000 plants, but I actually think it's probably more than that. And we actually thought it was down to just kind of a manageable control program until I think it was two years ago, three years ago now. Um, we found like a huge new population that just kind of blanketed an area, which was a good reminder for me, and just kind of an educational awakening like that's why we had spent all that time controlling the species because when it starts growing it will just dominate and nothing else is growing in this area um it's another one that i've actually seen planted in flagstaff so i would encourage you that if you do have it in your yard it would be great to cut the seed heads before they actually produce viable seed even though they're beautiful um it's starting to spread in the rio de flag and other areas around Flagstaff. So if you do have this one in your yard, you may just want to consider that. Great King is actually really lucky with Russian olive. How many of you have been on the San Juan River? There are areas where you can't even get off the river. It's so dense and thick. It's a thorny tree. It's very difficult to walk through an area that's got a lot of Russian olive. And in Great King, I think we probably removed about maybe like 110 trees. And we actually have a trip out right now that's going back to every single site and revisiting it to see if there's any regrowth and then removing those trees. So I feel like we've been really fortunate with that tree. Um, again, it can produce these incredible